So my name is Graham Heinsen. I'm from the University of Adelaide. And normally I would love to have been part of this workshop today. I'm currently on sabbatical in Barcelona in Spain. But Stefan has asked if I can still contribute by giving a presentation on magnetotelics in Australia from the past, the present, and some comments about future trends. This figure here is taken from Graham Begg from the Uncover initiative, and it shows the scale length of MT surveys. So on the left-hand side, long period MT covers the entire lithospheric system. Broadband MT ranges from the surface down to about the moho and therefore images the crustal system, and particularly the link between the lower crust and the upper crust. And finally, on the right-hand side, AMT, or audio magnetotellurics, gives resolution in the 0 to 2 km scale and can be used for direct detection. So MT can span the entire scale length of a mineral system and these days new instrumentation can span all of these different techniques with one set of magnetometer coils. From the 1960s to the 1990s, most electromagnetic surveys were undertaken using just magnetometers, time-varying magnetometer records, to give geomagnetic depth sounding information. You can see the scale and the range of these surveys. The reds and the greens are just different uh, vintages. Um, and typically, they were within 5 to 50 kilometer spaces. They were used to map out big scale crustal conductivity anomalies and in particular they were very very good at mapping out large conductors that occur within probably the top 10 kilometers of the earth. However the scaling and the spacing of the instruments meant the resolution was always quite poor and with geomagnetic depth sounding there's very little information about the depth variation of resistivity, just the lateral changes. From 2000, the emphasis was switched more to doing MT, either as broadband in the blue symbols or long period in the yellow, along transects, and particularly following seismic reflection lines. They were modelled, typically, using two-dimensional inversion schemes, and the figure inset shows the uh, profile along the Olympic Dam Survey using long period instrumentation along 200 kilometer lines and showed the first indication that the ore deposit at Olympic Dam had a major conductive uh, signal in the lower crust. From 2000 as well, the first long period MT arrays were starting to be deployed. There's three shown in this figure. Monash University undertook a, a survey uh, looking at the newer volcanic province. Stefan Thiel and colleagues carried out MT in the Stewart Shelf and across the Gaula Craton. And a group from the University of Göttingen in Germany carried out uh, big surveys across Queensland and the Northern Territory. The figure at the bottom shows the slice from a very early three-dimensional model undertaken by Stefan and colleagues showing a large conductive uh, structure at the base of the lithosphere underneath the Gawler Craton. This was with relatively few instrumentation and, uh, and relatively few sites, but it gave the first uh, indications that array studies across Australia would provide large-scale constraints on the electrical properties of the continent. And of course, why we're all here today is the release of the OSLAMP data um, OSLAMP is a 50 kilometre, or roughly 50 kilometre, or half a degree survey across the entire continent. To date, uh, about a third of the continent has been completed. And the figure uh, at the top shows the array across South Australia, a little bit into Western Australia, across the Musgraves, Victoria and Tasmania. The inset figure at the bottom shows a more up-to-date um, indication of Auslamp. The red uh, dots at the top in the Northern Territory and in Queensland have been undertaken by Geoscience Australia. Um, and the green areas in 
Northern Territory and New South Wales are also in progress. The intention is to cover the entire continent over the next 10 years to provide a wealth of new information which we'll hear more about today. So looking into the future, one of the major developments we've had over the last 20 years that has made these much, much larger surveys feasible is in the improvement in instrumentation and the ability to store and process data. There's lots of scope for future developments with distributed arrays, with the possibility of deploying instruments by drones, and just to record more data at more places to provide a better constrained model. The other area of development has been in three-dimensional inversion. Until about 10 years ago, three-dimensional inversion was still done very sparsely, very coarse grids, and was expensive and time-consuming. The speed has improved considerably, the codes are now much more available, but it is still quite an art to get a good three-dimensional inversion from a set of data. And I think in the next 10 years, we'll see some very significant improvements in the way we invert data. Another area of development has been in the incorporation of other sets of geophysical and geological data. This is just one example of joint inversion where MT is combined with seismics, MT, gravity and magnetics to improve to better interpretation. Now, this is a very specific example from a sedimentary system, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get better quality models with more geological interpretation when we can incorporate more data sets. The other big development we've had within Australia and globally has been the number of people who have been using MT and, uh, and have the ability to be able to collect good data and invert good data. Um, so training people for the future is a very important part of the MT process and it's often overlooked. So in terms of past and present, we've had it's a long established technique but it's been finding new niche applications. So the technique's been around for almost 70 years now but it's really only in the last 10 to 15 years that we've seen MT being applied to image an entire mineral system rather than just a single deposit. A lot of that drive has come from government, from Geoscience Australia, from the states and territories, and has been in, in the field of pre-competitive data. And it's driven by the philosophy of uncover, mapping the entire lithospheric architecture. We've also seen MT being used in scale reduction, going from long period MT on the Auslan scale to broadband MT, where data are collected perhaps at five kilometre spacings or less, and down to one kilometre spacing for AMT. And that we're moving from terrain to regional to camp to deposit scale. And in terms of things for the future, I think it's still plausible to have more sites for redundancy of information and that requires having cheaper instrumentations um, that can be deployed quickly. The other area is rapid three-dimensional inversion and at the moment our inversions still take many days and still require a lot of tuning. We like to go from days to hours to minutes and we've seen that progression happen with one-dimensional and two-dimensional inversions so it's no reason to think the three-dimensional inversion won't undergo the same evolution. But what would be also very nice is to have some method of directly imaging three-dimensional data and producing outputs in the same way we can with one dimension by some uh, transformation. We need to do better at constraining with other geological and geophysical data and putting in more information about model uncertainty. And with that, Wish you well and hope you have a terrific workshop today. Thank you.